Uh, our next witness wishes to be known as John, does he? Yes, sir. John. And I think Kate is coming to sit with him. My name is John McDougall. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. John, you're here to talk about your son, Ewan. Uh, you're also going to tell us a little about your brother-in-law, Terry. Yes. And Ewan's mother, Kate, Terry's sister, sits beside you, and she's also provided a statement to the inquiry. Yes, indeed. Ewan was born in 1977. That's correct. And diagnosed um, from an early age with severe haemophilia A. Yes, indeed. Uh, you knew, you and Kate knew about haemophilia because Terry... Uh, had severe haemophilia himself. Kate That's Scott correct, had. yes. Uh, and Terry had been treated as a child for his haemophilia, how? Terry, um, who is a couple of years younger than Kate, had been treated initially with snake venom, which must have been in the 1950s, and then with uh, whole blood uh, transfusions. Apparently by the age, <clears throat> by the time he was four years of age, Terry had had over 100 pints of, of blood, whole blood. Um, and then he was treated with plasma, and then cryo, cryoprecipitate, and then uh, laterally with uh, factor eight. And you said in, in your statement that from Terra's perspective at the time, the factor eight product seemed a godsend because they were more convenient and easier to use. Yes, indeed, yes. Now, Ewan was under the care of York Hill. Yes. Uh, and uh, what was the treatment he received in the first couple of years of his life? <coughs> uh, as you said, Ewan was born in 1977. So his first couple of years, um, he was treated with um, cryoprecipitate and probably 1980, 79-80, uh, 80, let's say, he, he was uh, treated with factor 8. Uh, and was that on a prophylactic basis? It was not initially on a prophylactic basis. In, initially, it was a, a, a reactive basis. If there was a bleed, and uh, in the very early days, if there was a bleed, then we would take, uh, Kate and I would take uh, Ewan uh, to York Hill Hospital, and he'd be treated at the hospital. There came a point at which uh, Kate was trained to give Ewan the factor eight injections at home and he moved on to a home treatment programme. Yes, that that's right? correct, that's correct. And how often would Ewan receive factor eight products? Um, again, in, in the early days, uh, when, it, when it was on a, uh, a reactive basis, then Ewan would require factor eight uh, for a bleed, maybe fortnightly, a couple of two or three times a month, so that, that, that sort of frequency in, initially. And then once we moved on to the, the prophylaxis, then it was twice per week. Um, and that was a great benefit at, at, at that time. The, the home treatment was a great benefit and, and the prophylactic treatment was a, a great benefit. The combination of these two things meant that from about 1981 or so, uh, Ewan was, he, he was a normal boy, he, he was a four-year-old, five-year-old boy, um, playing football, running about, just, just normal. So it, we, we felt we'd sort of conquered uh, haemophilia. What, what can you recall about which factor products at this time Ewan received, where they were from? 
Um, in the earliest days, I recall, um, because they reside in our fridge, so I would see them alongside orange juice and things like that. Um, in the earliest days, I, I remember they, they were from the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. And I remember the, 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 there was an address in Helen's Glen in Edinburgh. Um, and then, uh, at some point in 81, 82, 83, then American blood started appearing, and it was from a company called Armour. And did there come a point at which Ewan was receiving almost exclusively the Armour products, or the US products, rather than the Scottish products, or, or did it continue to be a mix? It, there, there continued to be a mix, and the balance switched, the, the, the balance switched to Armour, to, to, to the US product. Um, I wouldn't say exclusively, because it, by the time we got to be 83, 84, then we were requesting uh, Scottish uh, factor aid from Scottish donations. Um, but sometimes all it was, most times all that was available was the American product. But, but we would still be requesting the Scottish product, so, so there must have been occasions when it, when it was there. And, and we'll come on in a moment to the reasons, the specific reasons why you were making that, that request. But just the earlier stage, when you and started to be given the American products or the commercial products for the first time, was anything said to you at that stage or indeed at any of the early stages about any risks of infection associated oh, no. with that? No. Indeed, it was the benefits that were stressed. Um, the benefits being <coughs> benefits of, uh, of administration. It, 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 uh, the kit was all together. For the Scottish one, you had to go and get distilled water and do things. And it dissolved more quickly. The, the American product dissolved in 20 minutes or 25 minutes. And the Scottish product, for some reason, it, was, it took 40 minutes or 50 minutes. So it was more convenient in those terms. In, in terms of the balance of convenience versus safety, if anything had been said to you, and Kate, about any risks of infection associated with the use of the products, balanced against the, the convenience and the advantages. What would your decision making have been? Oh, I mean, a complete no-brainer, and, and I think for any parent. I mean, if if you're comparing convenience with eliminating risk for your child, then you're going to always going to select the elimination of risk for your child over convenience, of course. And so when, when you and first started using the factor eight concentrates, the products, no advice or information about infection. When he moved on to the home treatment or prophylactic, was any, any advice or information or warnings given at that stage? Re regarding risk? Regarding risk. No. Were you uh, given any product leaflets to, to read and consider in relation to any of those products? Uh, again, specifically just in the American product? No, no, no. any of the factor eight products that you uh, and Oh, you, um, well, we had leaflets on how to, uh, how to administer it, how to dissolve it, how to put it together, and with training. Um, starting with, I remember, with, with injecting oranges, because apparently oranges have got the same degree of resistance as, as human flesh. Uh, so, yes, we had a sort of training package. But, but nothing that related to risk? Nothing that related to risk. You have a recollection, whilst you were on a business trip to Holland, in, in about 1982, of, of reading something that gave cause for concern. What was that? Yeah, it was against the background, as I say. By, by, by 81, uh, you know, we sort of felt we'd conquered haemophilia. Um, and at, at that time, I was working um, in the Netherlands quite a lot, and I think it was during... I was working in the Netherlands in 81, 82, so I, and I think this was in 82. And I was on a, a KLM flight from Glasgow to Amsterdam. <clears throat> and as you go into the flight, they've got newspapers that you pick up. And I was reading the Times, and there was an investigatory piece in the Times. It was quite a long article... <clears throat> and it was about um, HDLV3, uh, HIV, and it was talking about the, the prevalence of HDLV3 in, in the States, 
and uh, which I'd read about before, but what made this article different was it then moved on to say <coughs> that haemophiliacs were particularly at risk and it could mean the elimination of haemophiliacs. They, they could all die. And it was saying that the reason for that was because um, it took so many pints of blood, so I've forgotten the number, but it was, a, it was hundreds of pints of blood, or perhaps even thousands of pints of blood, uh, to make a, a, a file of, of, uh, of factor eight. Um, and so the risk, you weren't just being exposed to one person, you were expo exposed to hundreds of people. Um, and it was talking about, uh, because of that, that magnified the risk for uh, haemophiliacs. Uh, so where someone getting a whole blood transfusion, it might be a one-to-one, -one, but for a haemophiliac, it might be a thousand, to, a thousand people to one, and therefore the risks were greater, and therefore statistic, and there was no cure, and therefore statistically, it could mean all haemophiliacs dying. And I remember reading that on um, the plane going to Amsterdam. And um, I just froze. Was anything of that kind, any of those concerns, conveyed to you in 1982 by any of the doctors or staff caring for you and prescribing his treatment? No, they were not conveyed to us, but obviously we were then aware, and, and it, was, it was popping up in the press. Um, but no, we were, we were not. It, it was the other way around. We, we would approach the staff at York Hill Children's Hospital in Glasgow, uh, rather than them approaching us. Uh, also, at that time, th there was a number of, of uh, haemophiliac boys, all boys, obviously, um, at York Hill at that time, I think the number was about 20, um, and we formed a, a haemophiliacs parent support group. <coughs> um, so typically there might be, you know, a dozen parents or 14 parents. It was a social thing, it was a support thing rather than anything else. And, and Kate was the secretary. Um, so there was minutes taken of, of, of what we were discussing. And I sort of loosely chaired uh, these meetings. Um, so it's cups of tea and biscuits and, and, and a chat about American blood and, and things like that. So, so we discussed it in, in the parents group. <coughs> and uh, we discussed things like heat treatment in, in the, the parents group as well. I'm talking end of 82, 83, 84. And as a consequence of these discussions in the parents group, we would then approach the staff with questions that, that, that had arisen. And when you either, really on Ewan's behalf or as part of the parents group, when you and other parents approach the staff to, to ask questions, to express your concerns, can you recall what, if anything, was the response? Um, the staff knew as well. Um, you know, they, they, they would, I mean, clearly they weren't living in some bubble where they were denied access to this information, so, so, so they knew that type of thing as well. Um, but they would, they would try to reassure us, but also if we were going in for, for, for Factor 8, then, and we were asking for Scottish Factor 8, they would be pleased to give us Scottish Factor 8. I say Scottish, I understand it was Scottish and Northern Irish. That was, was, was a funnel together. We were told that at the time. Um, so they were pleased to give us Scottish uh, product uh, rather than American product. But if, if there were no Scottish product, and increasingly that was the case, increasingly it was just the armour product uh, that was there, then they would sort of apologetically um, give us the the American factor eight. Now in 1983, Terry, Kate's brother, your brother-in-law, um, uh, uh, started to become ill and was diagnosed with what we would now refer to as HIV, HTLV3. That's correct. Okay. Uh, t t Terry um, 
uh, Terry was a severe haemophiliac as well. <coughs> uh, different generation from Ewan, so, so by 80, 83, Terry would be 33 years of age, so he was, he was, he was a man. Um, and as a haemophiliac, around about 82, so he'd be 32, uh, Terry chose to move from Wisher in Lanarkshire, he chose mm -hmm. to move uh, there to Newcastle. And his reason for moving to Newcastle was to be treated at Newcastle Infir Royal Infirmary, the infirmary in Newcastle. Um, but particularly, the, the magnet for, for Terry to go there was a Dr Jones, who uh, Terry believed to be the foremost expert on haemophilia uh, in the UK. And so that's why, as a man, Terry chose to, as an adult, Terry chose to go to, uh, uh, go to Newcastle at 82. <clears throat> and he'd been there, he'd been there a year or so. So, as, as you say, perhaps the middle of 83, September 83, something like that. Uh, autumn 83, Terry uh, started to become ill um, and he later died of AIDS. And Terry started warning you and Kate about American products specifically. He would telephone you and you would have conversations. What can you tell us about those? Terry, so, you know, again, as I say, Terry was an adult and, um, and he was in Newcastle because he believed that's where the best treatment was. And I don't know if that was the case or not, but, but I knew Terry and it was probably very, very good treatment. So he, was at, he, he had access to information um, that was telling him, and obviously he had a very strong vested interest in this, uh, so it wasn't just tittle-tattle, um, but from the back end of 83, he was contacting us every couple of months. This was before email, so he'd be telephoning or he'd be sending letters. And he, he, and he was saying, don't use American Factor 8. And then he was also saying, heat treatment is the answer. So that, that was the two messages uh, coming, coming from Terry. And you um, and Kate, from then onwards, renewed your efforts, as it were, to try and avoid the use of US products yes. for UN, and you asked for non-American products as yes. much as you could but they weren't always available. They weren't always available, and sometimes, uh, you know, if you had a particularly bad bleed, <coughs> um, and if we went into uh, York Hill, you, you was still being treated at York Hill at that stage, and if we went into York Hill and they only had American Factor 8, then, as I've mentioned before, it's a Hobson's choice. Um, you either let the bleed continue, which is a guaranteed very negative scenario, or you take the risk of the American Factor 8 with the medical staff, the nurses and the doctors assuring you that it's okay. So it's a choice, and given that choice, you're going to choose the American product. Your impression, as described in your statement, is that the decisions at York Hill on what products would be used and maintained in stock were the decisions of Dr Willoughby, then the, uh, one of the consultants? I think that. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that, that's what I believe to be the case. Um, my reason for saying that is um, Dr Willoughby was... Um, he was one of the pioneers and one of the drivers of home treatment and of prophylactic treatment. And that, as I said earlier, that made a big difference. That, 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 was, a, that, that was a boon, that, that, that was a big positive uh, for, for us and for, and for any haemophiliac or, or, or parents in that situation. Um, so Dr Willoughby was, was at the cutting edge, at the leading edge of prophylactic treatment and, and home treatment for, remember these boys are seven, eight, nine, ten years of age, so it was, it was quite leading edge, you know, you know, for home treatment for relatively young, you're not talking about a 25-year-old adult, 
Um, so he was driving that, and we much appreciated that. And my belief then is that, and prophylactic treatment, as I said, we injected you at home twice per week, so you needed more factor eight, as opposed to on the reactive basis where you're maybe using it once a fortnight. So you, so you probably needed four times as much factor eight as would otherwise have been the case. And you've got the same level of blood donations. <laughs> you know, so, so the actual raw blood coming into the system would be roughly, roughly the same amount. Um, but in order to use it f for home treatment on a pro prophylactic basis, you would need more factor eight. So my belief then is, th is that with, factory, with American factor eight being cheaper, because you needed more, then it probably made sense to source the cheaper product because you could get more of it, and that could allow you to have more home treatment, more prophylactic treatment, which were good things. Um, and so I can well understand that, that it would make sense in someone's minds to, to, to do that, to, to, get, to get the cheaper product because you can get more of it, and it allows you to do this good thing with, 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 the, with the great amount of product. But that was at the same time as the risks were known regarding American Factor 8. The risks were beginning to be known. I mentioned the article in the Times, and we spoke about Terry and so on. So it, it, it was against the background of it not being risk-free or thought to not be risk-free. And if Dr. Willoughby was comparing convenience of home treatment and prophylactic treatment, which was great, with a risk, then again, as I said earlier, any parents would want the elimination of the risk rather than, rather than the I mean, you're talking about 20 minute drive to Glasgow, so the convenience you've got to put in perspective, it was convenient, but it was, you know, that's what it was, it was convenient in that sense. What he certainly didn't do was to discuss it with the parents or to discuss it with us or, or to discuss it with other parents and to come to a, a, a consensus. Um, so in that sense, then I think it was his decision. My take on Dr Willoughby also at that time, he was about 20 odd years older than me, um, but he seemed to me at that time, bear in mind we're talking the early 80s, um, but he, he seemed quite old school. And within the haematology department, then I would imagine that Dr. Billaby would make the decision rather than. I don't think the haematology department was a democracy. I don't, I don't think they had a vote on it. I, I think that Dr. Willoughby would make the decision. And it's also your understanding, as set out in your witness statement, that York Hill used more American products and for longer than other hospitals in Scotland. The thing, as a parents group and as individuals, the, the, one of the things that really surprised us was, um, not surprised, but, but, but perplexed us for a long period of time, was, uh, as I say, with, with this drip feed of information from Terry telling us not to use American Factor 8. We had, in the press, there was indications that American Factor 8 was uh, risky, and given the reasons why. And then increasingly, you saw other Scottish hospitals stopping using American Factor 8. Um, and if you put all these things together, then you know, it's a bit of an outlier to, to continue to use American Factor 8. So, so York Hill was a bit of an exception. And the only reason I can think of why it would be an exception like that was the, was, was the reason that I gave earlier, which, which is um, with, with Dr Willoughby being a pioneer in home treatment, prophylactic treatment, then perhaps he thought that, you, you know, it was necessary for that. 
But that was, a, that, he was coming to a conclusion that was different from the conclusion, as far as I know, different from the conclusion in other hospitals in Scotland. Now, Terra's health continued to deteriorate throughout 1984. Yes. And he died of AIDS on the 3rd of November 1984. Yes. Terry was in Newcastle, as I said. <coughs> um, he, he became very ill in Newcastle. Um, I can remember that in April or May in 1984. I, I remember it was April May because I, I completely unrelated. I was in the hospital April May 1984, so I know where I was at that time. And I remember Kate's family at, at that time went down to Newcastle to bring Terry back. Um, so Terry clearly couldn't come back himself. He, he, he was clearly incapable of getting on a train, or I don't think he drove, but got on a train and coming back. So the family went down to bring Terry back April, May 1984, and Terry died on the 3rd of November. He, he then got, he, he stayed at home in Wishaw. Um, I remember him, a bed was made up for him downstairs in the living room beside the television, behind, uh, beside the family. So the family all sat together. There was a lot of press attention after Terry's death. What can you recall about that? When Terry died on uh, 3rd November 1984, um, it was a different background then. That was 35 years ago. And AIDS was seen very much as being the gay plague. Um, it was seen in very negative terms. There was an incredibly negative stigma that was associated with it. I'm, I'm saying things that you know. Um, all references to it in the press were, were very, very negative at that time, very sensational. <coughs> um, and when Terry died, uh, beginning of November, then my memory of, of if, we, if we went out to Kate's parents' home uh, in Wisher, and the, the curtains were drawn because the body was in the house. Um, I think the body was in the house, but the curtains were certainly drawn. And if you opened the curtains, then the press were outside on the pavement and the photographers, the, 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 the cameras would start flashing. And you close the curtains quickly. Um, and the, it, was, it was front page news. Uh, Terry was the first haemophiliac to die of AIDS in Scotland. So it was, it was front page news, but it was also a, a, it was a milestone for haemophiliacs in Scotland. He was the first one to, to, to die. The tone of the article, not all of them, but the tone of the articles, most of them w w were placing it against this in the context of the gay plague and homosexuality and so on. By that I mean... Uh, when Terry died, he'd be 34. So that, you know, it, 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 there'd be sentences like 34-year-old um, 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 unmarried man from Wisher dies of gay plague, AIDS. You know, uh, so it, it would, the insinuation would be mm. that Terry was gay. So it was against that sort of background. But as I, as I say, that was 30, 35 years ago. So it, it, it's it's difficult that and lots of other things about it the, the stigma and so on it's difficult to understand it now we've, we've got um, an example of a newspaper article Paul could we have 2850002 it's perhaps one of the less unkind articles and I, I know you've seen it um, uh, so it's the 20th of November 1984 in the Daily Mail Seven month hell of man dying from AIDS. AIDS victim Terry McStay went through seven months of hell before he died, it was revealed yesterday. The haemophilia sufferer contracted the virus after being treated with the blood plasma product factor eight at Newcastle's Royal Infirmary. AIDS, most prevalent amongst homosexuals, destroys the body's defense mechanism against disease. And then it quotes 
Terry's GP saying of Terry that Terry showed tremendous courage. It was a nightmare for him. None of the treatments we tried had any effect. He just got weaker and weaker, and all we could do was help relieve his pain. Terry had suffered enough in his life battling against haemophilia without catching AIDS. He'd actually gone through hell all his life, but he'd gone through hell all his life, but was actually managing to keep the haemophilia at bay when AIDS struck. It was stressed that Mr. McStay, a 34-year-old lab technician, was not homosexual. And then if we just have the whole page, please, Paul. Can you go down towards the bottom of the page, please? And we'll see there some other examples uh, and the reference in the bottom one, not specifically there about um, Terry, but about the gay plague. That was November 1984. Um, in December 1984, you have a recollection of Ewan receiving heat-treated factor yes. eight products for the first time, is that yes, right? Yes, correct. And we have a record of it as well. So it's not just a recollection. <coughs> um, as I said earlier, about a year before that, so the back end of 83, uh, and during 83 actually, uh, from early 83 probably, uh, T Terry had been telling us from Newcastle that heat treatment was the answer. Um, he, was advised, he was telling us not to use American Factor 8, to use Scottish, but clearly there would still be an imagined risk or a potential risk with Scottish Factor 8, so, but heat treatment was the answer. So regardless of the source of the product, if he heat treated it, then that was, the, that was Terry's message. Um, because the heat treatment kills the virus. Uh, so... Uh, we knew that from, from about 83. And we discussed at the parents' group, as I said before. We had information from Terry. Two months later, Terry would contact us again, saying, of, you know, what have you done? Have you done anything about it? Or have you got them to change it yet? And, um, and then Terry died on the 3rd of November, uh, 84. Prior to that, clearly, we'd been pushing for heat treatment. And, and as a parents group, we'd been pushing for heat treatment for the reasons I've just said, because we believed it was the answer. And we were told repeatedly, six times, ten times, you know, lots and lots of times, we were told that heat treatment was not... It was not possible to introduce heat treatment on the factory product, so it's a Scottish product I'm specifically talking about here, um, for two reasons. One was it reduced the efficacy of the factor eight uh, of the product itself and it would increase the cost. So efficacy would go uh, down and cost would go up. And we had received that answer many times during 83 and 84. Then Terry died in the third of um, November 84. <coughs> and those articles that you showed there were from the 20th of November 84. So these articles were from 17 days after Terry died. And those articles mention the introduction that in Scotland going to introduce heat treatment, which was impossible three weeks before. <coughs> um, And our Ewan was then uh, treated uh, with heat with a heat treated product. That was on a date in December. On the fifteenth of December, eighty four. So five weeks after, five and a half weeks after Terry died, um, Ewan was uh, given the heat treated product. And. That's okay. My my understanding. My understanding is. John, shall I paraphrase, uh, and you can tell me if I'm correct? That's or? okay. I'm okay. okay. My, my understanding is that is that uh, no hemophilia that was treated solely with um, heat treated factor eight after that date. That, that no haemophilia then died. 
So I think the heat treatment indeed was the answer. I think that's proven. I think it took Terry's death to uh, the death and the attendant publicity, um, which was, uh, as I say, was quite sensational and quite negative. Um, and I think it took that death to spur um, the appropriate health authorities in Scotland and in the UK more widely, certainly in Scotland, into action. It took a death. And just dealing with the record that you mentioned you have, your, your solicitors have asked the relevant health authority for copies of Ewan's records. And as I understand it, they've been told that there are no trace of any records for you and that, that are now held. None at all. None at all. You've got this one record which shows the details of the heat treatment that you and received in December 1984 that you yourselves have kept. Yes, I, 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 at the request of the hospital, at the request of York Hill. Um, so when we started heat treatment in uh, 1981, let's say, uh, then every every home on this home treatment, oh, sorry, home treatment, home treatment on this home treatment scheme, um, then there was probably a dozen or fifteen haemophiliacs at York Hill participated in this, <coughs> and we were all given the format in which to we were all given the training that I referred to earlier, the oranges and so on. Um, but we were also given a format in which to record what we were doing. Um, so you, any time you administer Factor VIII, uh, you had to record the date, you had to record the reason, so it was a, a, a bleed in the left knee or the right elbow or whatever. Um, you had to record the batch number of the Factor VIII that, that you used. Uh, you had to record the the impact that that then had, you know, like 12 hours later, how did it look? 24 hours later, how did it look? Plus any other details. So there, there was a... <clears throat> if it was today, it would be a spreadsheet, but then it was just a piece of paper with, with uh, columns and rows on it. Um, and we were all given that format uh, to, to record each uh, administration of, of at home of Factor Eight. So we started doing that, and, and, and Kate recorded it uh, from 81 onwards. And so we've got a record of all the administration of factory with all the batch numbers, and, and all the other parents must have had that as well. And then on the 15th of December, 1984, and Kate's writing is heat treatment with asterisks, along, heat treated uh, batch with asterisks alongside it. Uh, on that. that was the introduction of the heat-treated uh, product at that point, 15th of December, 84. So you've got your own records that yes. you maintained at home, but there are no hospital records in respect no hospital of records. the UN's treatment at the, all. The, the hospital records disappeared um, uh, and are gone, uh, destroyed. Uh, York Hill Hospital, at some point after that, then requested that we send the home record back to them and we did not do that, we retained it. Now, in April of 1985, Kate took you into a regular appointment at, at York Hill and saw one of the doctors there, Dr Pettigrew, I think, and was given some information about you. And what, what was Kate told? Uh, it was April 1985, as you say, so that was like um, five months after uh, Terry died. Um, four months after Ewan had started receiving heat treated factor eight. Um, so at, at, at that point then clearly what's in our mind is we're absolutely delighted that Ewan's getting heat treated factor eight but we're wondering about this legacy of, of, of factor eight that, 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 that they had received up until December 1984. <coughs> um, and then the, 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 there was a regular clinic every two months or something like that. And Kate took Ewan along to that on April 85. I was not there, but my father uh, was with Kate. <coughs> um, and he stayed 
in the car. So he, he remained in the car park at York Hill when Kate went into the clinic. Um, and while she was in, then she was informed that Ewan was uh, HIV positive. Um, at that same clinic, then there were at least two other parents who were also of other haemophiliacs who were also informed that their son was HIV positive because one of these other parents said to Kate, and Kate recorded it, um, one of these other parents then said to Kate, I've just been told my son's got AIDS. Um, so there was at least three who were told on the same day in April 85. Had you and Kate known that Ewan was being tested for HIV or HGIV3? We didn't know. Um, we sort of suspected, um, it was the obvious thing to do, but, but <coughs> we weren't informed of it. We weren't, um, if we asked about it, we weren't told that he was. Um, but it would have been very strange if they had not been. And then a few days after that first visit where Kate had gone, you both went to see Dr. Patrick Green. Yes, yes. Um, and and um, what did she tell you? Well, I recall, uh, you know, um, again, this is against the background of the way it was at that time. So, you, you, you know, you think this is a death sentence. And I remember asking her that question, how long we had, you know, was not in the room, <laughs> um, how long we had ahead of us, and I remember she said it's got a very it's a virus with a very long incubation period. It could be five up to five years incubation period before it actually activates, and then once it's activated, it could be another two years before it actually dies. So that was in 1985. So that was suggesting 1992, and he died in January 94. So, as an estimate, it was quite accurate. And how old was you and when you learnt that he'd been infected with HIV? How old was you? That was April 85. So, Ewan was, uh, he would have been eight in June 85, so he was just short of eight years of age. You, the two of you, knew because of what had happened in particular to Terry, what being infected with HIV could mean. Yes. You decided at that point not to tell Ewan, who, as you say, was very young, what his diagnosis or prognosis was. Yes. I, I, you know, I, again, I say it's 35 years ago, and you've got to remember the climate, the, the, the social climate at that time the way it was viewed, so, um, which is very different from now, I hope. Um, but it, it seemed to make sense. It, it totally made sense. It wasn't, it wasn't even for debate. It totally made sense to keep it secret. Um, we decided we had to tell Ewan's teacher um, so that she could organise things properly at, at, at school and make sure that, you know, just in case you got a cut or... or um, so we told her. If we were away someplace, I remember once we were, we were in Oban and something entirely unrelated happened to you and for some reason we had to go to... Uh, we had to, to see a GP uh, in Tobermory and we told the GP and he said, that's fine, that's not a problem. Um, and he just, it was as though we said he's got a heavy cold and he, he, he was not phased in the slightest. Um, but we told so few people that you can actually remember the, the instances. So generally we told no one. And we didn't discuss it with Ewan, and Ewan didn't discuss it with us. 
which he would not necessarily do in the early stages because apart from knowing he was HIV positive, um, he continued to grow and he continued to be normal and he continued to play football and, and, uh, and so on. So he wouldn't necessarily discuss it with us at that stage. Um, but even later on, then, we did not discuss it. And it seems really odd, but it seemed natural at the time. But for the first four or so years, 1985 to 1989, after you were told you and diagnosis, life carried on in terms of Ewan's life pretty much as before, as I understand it. He wasn't particularly unwell during that period. 85 to 89? 89. No, he was, he, he was at school. He was <sighs> captain of the school quiz team. He was intelligent. He, was, he played football. Not very good, but there was no injection for lack of talent. So <laughs> I, I was... Uh, but no, he, he was... He, he led a normal life. And then... In September of 1989, you got a call from York Hill. What were you told? It was a... It, it was a Saturday morning. Um, I remember where I was, and I remember I, w I was uh, driving to, to a particular supermarket. And just before I left, I'd got a phone call from York Hill uh, saying could we pop in and, and see them uh, later that day. And then I was driving over to uh, the, the supermarket, and I was thinking, why, why, would, why would the phone, why, and it's a Saturday morning, and why would they want to see us on Saturday, why not Monday? Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, what's the only explanation for that? And I, I worked it out on, on, on this sort of five-minute drive. I, I knew wh why it was. <coughs> um, and uh, come back, and Kate and I went up to York Hill. Uh, this would be September '89, and uh, they took us into a little annex. Actually, it wasn't. It wasn't place that we normally went to. There was a little annex. And they told us that the HIV uh, virus had activated, was the word that they used. Um, obviously, they told us Ewan was infected in April 85, so we'd been sort of expecting this as you were getting close to April 1990. So this was like what, six months, seven months, eight months short of of, of that, so they, 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 they told us that it had activated. And, and you were told that they were going to put you on a drug called AZT? Yes. And what, what did that comprise, that treatment? That was uh, you know, onto uh, AZT. Uh, so they said that it wasn't a cure, but it could hold the, the progression of the, of the virus. Um, and Ewan was, was put on to a daily dose of AZT, uh, seven tablets per day, I remember, which at the time, it's seven tablets per day, so, you, you know, you don't think, why, why is it not four or three or 17, you just, it's seven. Um, so seven times uh, each day, seven seven tablets a day, you had to force these down with water, uh, which was always a, 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 a bit of an uh, episode, getting get them to do that. Um, and then later, a um, couple of years later, three or four years later, ten years later, it became clear um, with experience and with medical experience and so on that seven a day was a very, very high dosage of, e of EZT. Uh, I don't know what the doses is now. Uh, I, I know there's a, 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 a triple treatment along with two other drugs and, and e, e, AZT as well. <coughs> um, with you, and it was only AZT and um, seven, which, as I say, was quite a high dosage. Um, I don't blame anybody for it being seven. Um, if 
10 years later. If 10 years later people If people subsequently discovered that that was a high dosage, you're not blaming, the, as I understand it, the doctors at the time. Ewan seemed okay for about another year until the autumn of 1990 when his health began to deteriorate. You've given a yeah. couple of examples, John, in your statement yes. of, of yeah. how it used to become evident that yeah. Ewan was, was very um, tired. As you've probably gathered, he was uh, quite keen in football. Um, and we were at a football match in Glasgow. This would be September, October 1990. And there's quite a large crowd. Um, and Ewan would be... Uh, so he'd be, he'd be 13 years of age. Um, so he was smaller than, than most people in the crowd. But when we arrived, and people were standing, and those pe in those days people stood at, at football matches, <coughs> um, and Ewan was sitting on the on the terracing, and of course there, there's, a, there's a big crowd, so there's people standing immediately in front of him, so he couldn't see anything. And I was saying, you know, why stand up? You know, you won't see anything. And he said, I'm too tired. I'm, I'm too t I can't stand. And we left. We actually left at half time because he couldn't see anything. He was just sitting in the terracing. <coughs> um, and we went home. And by the time we got home, it was probably about four o'clock in the afternoon, and one of Ewan's friends arrived. And so we were looking for something else to do, and we decided to go to Dumbarton Rock for some reason, as you do. Um, and Dumbarton Rock's about 200, 300, 200 feet high, and it's got steps all the way up. And, and you didn't say he felt fine by this time, despite the episode a few hours ago at the football. Um, he, he now said he felt fine. And we started going up the steps, and he'd gone up about five or six steps, and he said, I can't go any further, I'm too tired. And he, and he sat there, and you, I, I and Ewan's friend went up to the top and we came back down again, and Ewan was still uh, sitting in the step. Both of these things happened in the same day, and that was the first physical impact that, that I could see um, in Ewan, was that totally debilitating tiredness that struck him on, on that day. In the course of 1991, the physical impact became more apparent and Ewan started losing weight. He, he previously, you described being one of the tallest in his class, but his peers were now outgrowing him and he was the smallest and the thinnest. From about that, that age, from, from about September 1990, um, the, you know, the, the, the day that was talking about there, <coughs> um, he didn't grow uh, from that point. And if it, he shrunk, he shrunk in all directions. Um, you know, you've seen it. You, you, you've seen photographs of it. You've, you've, you've seen it on television. Um, he just shrunk in all ways, uh, just gradually over time. So um, there are photographs of them, school photographs, you know, where they all line up and they're you know, the big ones are at the back and the small ones at the front and so on. Um, and so from photographs where Ewan would be one of the... He'd be in the middle at the back because he was tall. Um, then a couple of years later, by the time you got to 91, 90, the end of 91, 92, then he was the smallest in the class. Smallest, smallest and thinnest and weakest. And um, so from being a very outgoing... Um, um, enjoying cycling, footballing, that, that type of boy. Uh, very uh, bright, as I say, uh, you know, captain of the quiz team at school and, and winning the Scottish quiz uh, championship. 
Um, within 18 months, two years, then he completely changed physically and obviously it affected his um, social um, abilities as well. So he became much shyer and um, you know, less willing to mix with his friends and, and that type of thing. So it, it had a huge impact on him, yes. And it, it gradually happened during 91, yeah. And Christmas 91, you went on a holiday to Tenerife. Yes. But Ewan was unwell and you had to come home. Well, in six months before that, in the summer of, of 91, we'd gone, we'd gone on holiday. Um, we'd gone on holiday to, to uh, Spain, uh, Mallorca. And that had been a big success. So that was, you know, that, 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 was, um, um, that was a good thing to do. So we sort of knew to do it again, you know, so if it works, try it again. Uh, so when it came to Christmas, then we decided to spend uh, uh, Christmas in, in Tenerife. <coughs> um, and we arrived, I remember it was 75 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're thinking, well, that's really good, you know, Christmas in 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And then within an hour or two, Ewan became very ill, and he was very ill overnight, and his his, in his chest and his breathing was incredibly alarming. And so the next morning we knew that we had to get back to uh, Glasgow, back to York Hill. Uh, so we went to the airport and we obviously we were booked on our return flight a week later or something like that. So we, we explained why we needed to return so quickly within 24 hours or whatever, of, of having arrived, <clears throat> um, and they wouldn't let us on the plane, and we tried again another plane, we tried various airlines, um, we couldn't get insurance to get you and back, and, uh, um, and then eventually we did find an airline that was uh, willing to uh, bring you and back, so we came back to Glasgow, <clears throat> um, straight up to York Hill, and uh, that probably would be Boxing Day then, or... or uh, and I recall we also spent Hog uh, New Year's Eve, Hogmanay, um, in uh, York Hill uh, that year. So we must have been in York Hill from the 20, from Boxing Day to 3rd of January or something, something like that. So the, 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 the Tenerife adventure didn't quite work out. For the next few months, Ewan continued to try to go to school, but it, it, he was increasingly unable to go to school full-time. It dropped down uh, un until the following year he wasn't able to go to school at all. That's correct. Ewan had um, episodes of paralysis or seizures. Yeah. What could you tell us about that? That was incredibly alarming. Um, it happens a handful of times. I can't remember exactly how many, but four, five, six times. <clears throat> um, and the, the, the first time in particular was incredibly alarming. Uh, because you don't know what it is. You don't know what's happening. Um, but he would gradually, uh, over a period of an hour or so, he would be unable to move his limbs uh, he'd, be, he'd be totally paralysed, just comatose, just like a seizure. Um, and it would end up that his, his entire body was still... He couldn't move his body whatsoever, it, apart from his eyes. All he could move was his eyes. Um, and he'd be obviously lying flat. Um, he could hear and he could understand, but he couldn't respond. Um, and then it would last three hours, four hours, and then gradually, he would, you know, his right leg would start moving and then his left arm would start moving, and gradually he would come out of it. Five or six hours later, he would, it, it would pass. Uh, so the first time was, you know, 
enormously um, alarming. Uh, third or fourth time, you sort of get to know the pattern, and it always started with uh, his lips, with, uh, with some feeling he would get in his lips. So he would say, it's starting. You know, get me to your kill. It's, it's starting now. I can feel it. I can, I can feel this tingle in my, my lips. And, and we could get him into your kill in time. Uh, I remember one occasion arriving at your kill, getting him into the lift, and uh, other people come, <laughs> come into the lift. Oh, when it was happening, his, his legs used to involuntarily flip up, uh, like a seizure. Uh, and I remember in the lift in York Hill, we were up to the seventh floor, and we were in the lift, and there was two or three other uh, people in, on, on the lift. And I remember him saying, you stand in front of me, I can't, I can't stop my legs uh, moving about here, flipping about. Um, so by that time, as I, by that time, we were sort of normalised to that. As, I, as I've said before, you go through, it's like a staircase, you go down and, and each step you go down, you, you reach this new level and it, and it becomes normal. So, you know, he's got haemophilia and that's normal. And then he's HIV positive and that's normal. And then it activates and that's normal. And then you've got these seizures and that's normal. And he's losing weight and that's... No these things last six months, eight months. And life normalises at this new level. And then something else happens and takes you further down. And it's only later you look back over the decade or something, and you, you realise it was a series of steps that were that, that were taking you down. <clears throat> and just in exactly the same way, the, the seizures, the the the, um, the paralysis is probably a better uh, description of it. Uh, that became normal for it. We, we, we adapted to that in the sense that <clears throat> the. the one of the main... The, the, the paralysis, as I say, would last maybe four or five hours, six hours, maybe that sort of thing, which is bad and is inconvenient and, you know, so on. Um, but I used to say to him, it's not, it's not all that bad. You can still listen, put on the radio and listen to the... You know, it's... <laughs> but... He didn't know when it was going to happen. So it affected his life all the time. If he was going out, he didn't know if it was going to happen when he was out. If he went to school, he didn't know what was going to happen at school. If he went to Glasgow with his friends, he didn't know if it was going to happen. He, you know, you didn't know. Um, and that was a, a not knowing and worrying. You knew of other boys at York Hill who'd been infected with HIV. And you've said in your statement that between 1992 and 1994, a number of them died. Ewan didn't attend funerals, but he was aware that he had friends, acquaintances who were dying. You've said in your statement, Ewan didn't know what his diagnosis was from you, no. but you wonder whether he may have known it from other circumstances or what others might have said? Yeah, I mean, um, Ewan was friendly with other boys that were in the same situation, obviously. Um, not only was he friendly with them, he'd known them since he was a baby, so he was very friendly with them. Very comfortable in their, their company, and they shared the, all the issues that they'd had through their entire lives. <clears throat> and by the time we get to 93, 92, 93, I mean, Ewan's by that time he's 15, 16 years of age, so he's, um, so he wasn't discussing the situation with us and we were not discussing it with him, 
not in terms of AIDS and so on, we were discussing it in terms of the symptoms and, and the paralysis and, and the other things that happened as well, um, but not the underlying cause of it. Uh, so he did not have these discussions with us. Um, we also were recognised at that point that, that, given that you was 15, 16, that he was also not having that. He was not having that discussion with us. He was not initiating that discussion either. So perhaps he didn't feel comfortable talking about it either to us. So it was a sort of reciprocal thing, perhaps. Um, but given that he was friendly with other boys in the same situation and um, given that there had been deaths uh, already at that point with, with, within the group, then um, we were pretty certain and remain certain that Ewan did discuss it with other boys who, who were in the same situation as he was in. And roughly the same age. There, there's one that's in my mind just now that's maybe two years older than Ewan. So when Ewan was six, 15, 16, he was probably discussing it with a, a, a young man who was about 17, 18. In early 93, Ewan began to experience problems with his left eye. What, what happened? What, what treatment did he have to have for it? Um, it he had... Um, he started... He developed in his left eye. He, he, he developed a tunnel vision, so he could see through his left eye, but he could only see in a, a just like looking down a tunnel. Uh, so he would move his head rounds to, to 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 if there was a noise in his left hand side, he would turn his head to see what it was. He, he couldn't just look out the corner of his eye, <coughs> um, and that happened quite quickly. And. The treatment he was put on to was a, a, a drip uh, which lasted three hours. Um, so he, he was uh, fixed up to a drip uh, into his arm. Um, and as I say, it lasted three hours, which is a long time. Um, but more seriously, uh, it also had... had quite a, a, an impact on him in, in terms of nausea. It would make him very sick feeling. Uh, so we, we, for this daily drip, um, we then, because we did it at home, we had all the gear, all the, the, the all this stuff, uh, which we did at home as well. In fact, we had it mobile. We, 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 we would take it and we'd, we'd get a mobile home, uh, a motor home, and so we'd take all the, the drips with us. Um, but we, we would time it to be uh, starting maybe half past seven in the evening, so it was finished by ten o'clock, half past ten, and straight to bed, uh, so that when the, when the nausea kicked in, then he was in bed and, and sleeping. Um, and that was seven days a week uh, with that uh, with that drip. But he lost the sight in that left eye in about the spring of 1983. He absolutely hated the drip. I mean, it, it was, it was ruining, absolutely ruining his life. And he was very keen, uh, and, but it arrested the, the progression of the deterioration in his, in his eyesight. And he was very, so things weren't getting worse. Um, so he was very keen to reduce the frequency of the, of, of, of the drip, and uh, so they decided it just needed. He just needed to get the drip Monday to Friday, and not at the weekends. So he get the weekends off, um, which he was really pleased about for a couple of weekends. And then within a month, he lost his sight, his left eye. You and you and went on a trip to London. Yeah. Um, at a point in time at which he he he'd, wasn't he'd, able to see his left eye. You had some mobility problems, and yes. You and made a joke as you as you walked through London. Yeah, uh, it was actually when we were on the train, and the train was shaking back and forwards. <coughs> um, and I've got some mobility problems, as you say. And you and uh, couldn't see through his left eye. He just lost sight. Um, 
And uh, so we're, we're going down the corridor on the train, and I remember him saying, you know, you couldn't make a decent, you couldn't make a single human being between us. Uh, you couldn't make a, a whole human being between us. By the autumn of 1983, Ewan's right eye was affected. And he lost the sight in his right eye too. And Ewan said losing his sight was the worst thing that happened to him. Ewan's HIV care had transferred to a different hospital from York Hill. What yeah. was the experience for him like there? He, he, he lost his sight in his right eye by October um, 93, October 93. So May for the left and October for the right. Um, he, he'd, uh, as I said before, but you know, by that time Ewan was 15 years of age, 16 years of age. <coughs> Um, and York Hill obviously was a children's hospital. Um, so round about the end of 90, round about the beginning of 90, end of 92, beginning of 93, um, Ewan's treatment, which increasingly was not, increasingly it was not haemophilia they were treating, it was the AIDS they were treating. Uh, so his treatment was transferred to Rock Hill which was the serious infectious disease hospital in Glasgow. Um, and that was obviously very, very different from, uh, so that's uh, adults who were there. Everyone there had a serious uh, infectious disease. Um, I remember the first day that we were, Ewan was 15, he would be 15 when we were first, first there. Um, I remember the first time we went, we went into his room, made a bedroom, and I remember two uniform, uniformed people sitting outside the rooms on either side, because I didn't understand why there would be a uniformed person sitting outside the rooms. And uh, these were prison guards that were sitting outside the, the room, because the, the, the patients were prisoners, and so the guards were, were sitting outside. Um, so it was a very different environment from York Hill. Uh, things like, um, sometimes if we went into uh, Rock Hill, there'd be no uh, room available. So Ewan would just be out in the corridor, on a, on a trolley in the corridor. Uh, he'd spend the day, maybe two days, just in a trolley in the corridor. Um, there was a, a social room, a, 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 yeah, it was a, so, a television in it, and um, we would go. Remember, and as Ewan, after October '93, when Ewan could not see at all when he was blind, if we went in there and there'd be half a dozen men in there um, who would all be smoking, and Ewan would go in and he hated smoke and he couldn't see where he was, and he, 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 he just totally hated that. Ewan had got a payment of £20,000 in 1993, which I think initially the plan was to spend it on a caravan, but then he changed his mind and, and you bought a boat. Yeah, that's right. It was... Um, um, it was... It was it, it, that, that was... Um, that would be about April 93 that we got uh, £20,000 and it was in full and final settlement and we had to sign as such that it was full and final settlement. And we made the, de uh, the decision that... Um, Any money that we got, which is any money that we got, we should spend in Ewan. While he was alive. Do 
Yo qué sé. Should I? Okay. Should I start up my understanding? So we said, what do you want? Anything up to £20,000, not a penny more. And he said, I want a motorhome. Um, because we'd been, we'd been renting motorhomes with the, the drips and all that sort of thing. So he obviously fancied motorhomes. He liked travelling. Um, so we went up to Glasgow to buy a motorhome. And you know, there's a dozen motorhomes to, to, to choose from. But there was a boat, and this boat caught his eye. And he said, I want that boat. And I said, but you want a motorhome? He said, no, I want a boat. So we bought a boat, um, which was 29 feet long, which is quite a big boat for complete amateurs. Um, so the next day, everything had to happen very, very quickly. So the next day, it's in the water. So we got it into Loch Lomond, 26 miles long. Um, and we got this 29-foot uh, 20, boat that we've never seen before. And it was, it was a power boat, you know, and it, it planed and it came up out of the water, you know, it, was, it went very quickly. And I was, I was demonstrating to you how to how to drive this boat and he nudged me out of the way uh, and he said let's see what this baby can do and he, he, he took over the took over the wheel and for 26 miles he drove it up to the top of Loch Lomond and turned it, turned it round and drove it back down again we were overtaking the traffic on the road I remember you know um, yeah so that was um, that would be May, June um uh, 93. And you spent and celebrated Ewan's birthday? That was the last time we were on it, 28th of June, uh, 1993. Uh, it was his birthday. Ewan died on the 12th of January, 1994. <laughs> Yours and Kate's life in the years before Ewan died had been completely devoted to caring for Ewan and looking after him. He was yours and Kate's entire focus. Yes. Kate had given up work to look after him. Yes. Kate was a teacher. He was a senior teacher. She was a head teacher. She gave up work for eight years, something like that, yeah. She went back to work after you and I died. In the years since Ewan died, how has the loss of Ewan impacted on your lives? Um, we're now divorced. You developed serious health problems, which you think may well have been contributed to? I got a, a tumour, um, a, a, a benign tumour um, in the pituitary gland just below the brain, which was not diagnosed for uh, quite a number of years. But all the symptoms of that um, were, were attributed to... The symptoms were attributed to the stress of... Uh, of, of uh, Ewan's situation and then when it was diagnosed as a tumour uh, by that time it was the size of my thumb um, then um, it's considered that the stress caused the tumour and the tumour then caused the symptoms and Kate's statement describes the huge void in your lives after he died and how you feel that you've never had a normal life as a result. John, those are the questions I had for you. Before I ask those representing you if there's anything further, what, what else would you like to say? I think 
There are two things I'd like to talk about. Um, one is the American blood, and the other is heat treatment. Um, with the American blood product from Armour, then we had information from Terry during 1983 and during 1984 that there was a high risk with that American product. And that was known in the Newcastle Hospital. And it was also in the press and, and generally discussed in, the, 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 in society uh, as well. So there was known to be a risk with an American factor aid. And we had these prompts from Newcastle frequently. Our parents group meeting in York Hill Hospital frequently. This is the irony of the situation. Yes, it was discussed in York Hill by the parents. Um, so during 83 and 84, um, we were discussing the dangers of the American blood within the confines of York Hill Hospital as parents. 83, 84, you also had other hospitals in Scotland. I believe all other hospitals in Scotland stopping using American product. There has to be a very, very good reason why, given that sort of background, there has to be a very, very good reason why York Hill Children's Hospital continued to use the American product <coughs> during 83 and 84. The only reason I can think of, as I, as I said earlier, um, is with Dr. Willoughby being a pioneer of home treatment and prophylactic treatment, then he would need more factor eight and therefore buying it more cheaply, but perhaps allow him to, to buy more. That's just my speculation on that. I would love to know the real reason, if that's correct or not correct. I, 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 there, clearly there's a reason. It didn't just happen by accident. All the things that I said that, that we knew about, then Dr Willoughby and the senior staff in the haematology department would know these things as well, and they would know a hundred times more. I would love to know why they made a decision that was different from the decision that other professionals were making in other hospitals at, at the same time. And I would also, on that one, I would also like to know why, having come to the their decision, which there may be a valid reason for it that I'm not aware of, why it was not discussed with the parents, why the risk was not balanced against the convenience of, of home treatment and prophylactic treatment. So I'd like to know these things. And I've wanted to know these things for 35 years. And in the key treatment, again, we had this stream of information coming from Terry uh, telling us that heat treatment was the answer. So Terry first told us that in 1983. So what's that, 36 years ago? So we've known the answer to this for 36 years. Um, and you, as you saw earlier, I mean, it was introduced in Scotland in... December 1984. So as parents, we knew the answer 18 months earlier than that, because um, Terry was telling us. Again, a parents group were discussing it, and the parents group would be nominating people to go and discuss it with the staff, you know, why we're not heat treating, and we were getting reasons of uh, reduction of efficacy and increasing cost and we're getting these reasons right up until the 3rd of November in uh, 84 when Terry died. And then you, you, you saw the press articles from the 20th of November, less than three weeks after Terry died, and for, in several of these articles, then they say that they're going to introduce heat treatment. Um, and then Ewan got his first heat-treated product on the 15th of December 1984. 
four, which is either a remarkable coincidence that it was introduced so quickly after Terry's death, or, as I believe, Terry's death was instrumental in heat treatment being introduced. That first batch that Ewan got in the 15th of December, 84, we've got the batch number. I want to know when was that batch produced. I want to know Was it produced before the third of November? Was it sitting in stock? Unused, waiting? Was it produced after the third of November? Did they just simply turn on the, the, the heat treatment production after the third of November? I don't know, one way or the other. I'd like to know when, when that was produced. Terry died on the 3rd of November, so was that product simply made available uh, out of stock after that date, or did they actually start producing it? They must know that. They must know that. And that's the two, that's the two things. That's the, the, the two things that I need to know. I need to know the, the, the York Hill's policy, why they were using American blood, and I need to know why when the first batch of when that particular batch of heat treated factory was uh, when, it, when it was produced and sir before I ask John's representatives whether there's anything further I should say that Dr Willoughby has not yet been asked to respond to the statements um, but that process is in hand and he will be asked to provide a statement um, John I'm just going to ask Mr O'Neill if there's anything further No further questions for you, John, sir. There's just, just one for me. Uh, you've described your parents' group at York Hill, which must have brought you into contact with Dr Willoughby more than most, I suspect. Um, not really. Um, the, the doctor that was most involved uh, with the parents' group was a Dr Han. Less so Dr Willoughby. But you did meet Dr Willoughby on a number of occasions, did you? Yes, a few times. Uh, and you may be of an age uh, to remember the Doctor movies, yes. Doctor in the House and so on. Um, how closely did Dr Willoughby, in approach, match up to La Dr Lancelot <laughs> Rat? <laughs> yes, uh, quite, quite closely. I, I remember... Um, when Ewan was uh, tested for, um, uh, when he was tested for, for, for uh, haemophilia, uh, when he was only a few months old, um, I got a phone call uh, at home, and it, and it was Dr Willoughby who was on the other end of the, the, the line, and his purpose in phoning was to tell us that Ewan was a, had been diagnosed as a severe haemophiliac, so it was a very, very serious message that he was putting over. <clears throat> um, but his accent was, was so old school, um, I couldn't understand what he was saying. And I had to ask him to repeat it three times. Um, some, his accent was impenetrable to me. And 
eventually, on the third occasion, I realised he was telling me that my son was a severe, severe haemophilia. So it was the most unusual circumstances in which to, which to, to learn that. But um, I would describe him as, uh, as being old, old school, yes. So, does old, does old school mean autocratic, as you saw it? Yeah, as I saw it, yes, I would say he was, I would say he was autocratic. I, I mean, I, I don't know the workings of his, his, his department, the haematology department. I, I, I wasn't there at any... I, I'm only, I can only ask you for your impression. But, my, yeah. but you've, you've told us quite a lot about him, and so I just thought I'd ask. My, my, my impression is that uh, within that department that he would decide uh, what was going to happen. Um, I know that there was a number of staff within the department who were unhappy... I know there were nurses, I know that there were doctors within the department who were unhappy. Um, I can only guess about what they were unhappy about. They were unhappy enough to uh, work to rule um, on at least one occasion for, uh, for several days. Um, that then led to situations where, because they were working to rule, they would leave at whatever their formal finishing time was, four o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, regardless of whether something was finished or not, which meant that Dr Willoughby and the senior, senior consultants then had to finish whatever that task was. Because <coughs> um, I remember him complaining about that, and I remember the senior consultants complaining about that because the staff were, were, were walking. So it was an unhappy ship. Yes, well, thank you very much. Th thank you for coming and telling us what uh, was a, a, an affectionate tribute to Ewan, which cannot have been at all easy for you or for Kate. Thank you. So thank you. We'll take a break uh, now until 20 to 3. 20 to 3.